Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sumeya Saleh, and I will be moderating today's webinar alongside Dakshina Danidu. Today's webinar is on the fundamentals of constitution making and is hosted by the Asia Pacific Institute of Information Technology in collaboration with the International and Comparative Law Society. Uh, we do want to hear your thoughts and questions and will be open uh, for the Q&A during the final 20 minutes of the webinar. I thank you all for joining us today. It is with great pleasure I would like to introduce our distinguished guest speaker for today's discussion, Mr. Rohan Edrisinger. Mr. Edrisinger holds an LLB degree from the University of Colombo and an LLM from the University of California, Berkeley. He was also a member of the Faculty of Law uh, at the University of Witwatcher in uh, South Africa in 1995. Uh, he was also a fellow at the Harvard University and the University of Toronto. Um, Mr. Andy Swinger is, uh, uh, has been a um, much valued lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of Colombo from uh, 1986 onwards. Uh, he's also the founder, director, and head of legal division uh, for the Cent Center for the Policy Alternatives. He served as the constitutional advisor for the UNDP Nepal and the head of its constitution support program from 2011 to 2014. In 2015, he functioned as an independent consultant on constitutional reform and federalism in Myanmar and as a, governor, a governance advisor to UNDP Sri Lanka. Currently, he is a senior constitutions and political uh, officer for the Department of Political and Peacekeeping Affairs, United Nations, New York. I thank you for joining us today, Mr. Edrisinger. I would now like uh, to allow Mr. Edrisinger to commence today's discussion. Over to you, Mr. Edrisinger. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to, uh, to share with you some thoughts on the fundamentals of constitution making. I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm speaking primarily to uh, a, a group of students who, um, who, who are studying for their uh, British LLB. And uh, I think it's important to recognize at the outset that because of the very distinctive and possibly unique constitutional tradition in Britain, uh, many of the debates about constitution making uh, that take place in other parts of the world um, operate in a very different sort of context. Because Britain has an undocumented constitution, um, the, the, uh, I think what you probably have studied in your constitutional law course is very distinctive. In other parts of the world, the starting assumption is that one is engaged in making a written or documented constitution. And uh, uh, I'll be sharing with you some thoughts about trends with respect to constitution making and the basic principles with respect to constitution making. Um, I think it's important to recognize that in the last 45 years, we have witnessed new constitutions being drafted and adopted in more than a quarter of the world's countries. And this is partly because with the collapse of the Soviet Union, with the wave democratic democratization wave in Latin America and in Africa, a lot of emphasis was given on the need to draft new constitutions to consolidate the democratic gains. There are some people, however, who argue, and we probably don't have time to go into this, that in the last 10 years, there has been a reversal of this trend with the rise of populism and nationalism in Europe and in various other parts of the world. Uh, the argument is that that positive trend of 40 odd years is now in decline. And there is a counter 
sort of uh, political movement, which, uh, because it emphasizes populism and nationalism, is actually contrary to constitutionalism. And if we have time during the Q&A, maybe we can return to that point. But because there has been for over four decades, this emphasis on constitution making, there has built up during this period, a kind of international best practice uh, with respect to the fundamentals of constitution making. And I should stress that this is both with respect to the process or procedure by which constitutions are drafted and adopted, as well as with respect to substance. Another reason as to why there's been a lot of focus on uh, constitution making is that because there have been so many conflicts around the world, uh, and most of the conflicts around the world are not between countries, but are conflicts within countries, intrastate conflicts, there is a, a lot of emphasis on peace processes and how constitution making can be part of a post-war or post-conflict uh, peace process where you try to not only stop the war, but build on that and try to address the root causes of conflict. And so if you look at the literature today, it, there's, a, there's a kind of specialist area, uh, a distinctive area of what is called post-conflict or post-war constitution making. And we might talk a little bit about that as the lecture goes on. Um, partly because then of this growing interest in constitutions and constitution making um, and the recognition that constitution making perhaps can be a key feature of conflict resolution. Even the United Nations has uh, in the last 15 years or so uh, become more focused on constitutional issues. So for example, in 2006, the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, promulgated a guidance note on United Nations assistance to constitution making processes. It is currently being revised because it is felt that it's a little bit out of date and it needs to be updated. And if you look at that guidance note, which you can uh, access on the, any website and the UN website, um, there are some guidelines with respect to how constitution should be made, some principles with respect primarily to the process of constitution making. And then more recently, and I think this is an extremely significant development, in April 2016, uh, the United Nations General Assembly and the Security Council adopted without any dissent uh, the sustaining peace resolutions. And the sustaining peace resolutions actually call upon the United Nations to address the root causes of conflict, to strengthen its work in conflict prevention and conflict resolution, to recognize that very often conflicts uh, are, are caused by political considerations. So the UN actually was called upon to recognize the primacy of the political and to promote national reconciliation and try to develop also through constitutional assistance, inclusive political processes. So the sustaining peace resolutions of 2016 uh, are in my view, very important uh, 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 resolutions which uh, will help the United Nations to get more involved in constitution support. And then I'm sure you are also aware of the SDGs and SDG 16 in particular talks about the need to promote inclusive political processes and good governance. So my first point then is that there is like an interna a growing international recognition of the connection, if you like, between constitutions and good governance, constitutions and conflict resolution. And because of that, there is more focus then on trying to develop some basic principles with respect to both the process of constitution making and the substance of constitutions. But I do think that if we are going to focus on the fundamentals of constitution making, we should go first to basic principles of political theory and ask ourselves the question before we get into details about 
how is a constitution made? What is a constitution for? What is the purpose of a constitution? What is the objective of a constitution? And I think that this is very important. And it's in the light of that, that we can look at comparative best practice and comparative constitutions. And the study of comparative constitutions goes way back into history, right? I mean, uh, scholars say that Aristotle started comparing the constitutions of the various Greek city-states, uh, you know, in his time. Uh, if you look uh, at this part of the world, you have the, the Buddha being asked questions about, uh, you know, uh, the pros and cons of monarchies versus republics, uh, uh, the duties of a ruler, how should a ruler govern, uh, this whole notion then that a ruler doesn't have untrammeled powers, but the ruler has to govern according to certain basic norms and principles. Those are essentially constitutional issues, if you like. But we don't have time to go into all that, because I do think, however, that comparative constitutions and uh, comparative constitutional, uh, constitutional making, if you like, um, we're going to jump to the modern era, where the starting assumption was that a constitution is primarily to protect the people, and to empower the people. And so the people constitute the basic uh, sort of grund norm, if you like, when it comes to constitution making. And uh, the dilemma, it seems to me, is that it's almost as if the people recognize that they need a government for, for them to live, you know, uh, uh, peaceably and be able to carry out their normal functions. They recognize that the government needs to be given a certain amount of power so that the government can fulfill its basic functions and obligations. But the dilemma is, how do you ensure that the government, once given that power, exercises the power for the purpose for which it was given, exercises that power in trust for the benefit of the people, rather than exercises power for its own benefit and in a manner that undermines the the human rights and the best interests of the people. This seems to be the dilemma. And if you read about social contract theory, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, uh, or if you look at the debates about, uh, you know, that took place in the time of King Asoka in this part of the world, it's all about that, this dilemma then. How do you give power, but at the same time ensure that power is accountable? Now, in the Western world, there are two big constitutional traditions. And I believe that most of you at this law school will have studied uh, one of them. That's the British constitutional tradition, right? And the British constitutional tradition, I'm going to sort of uh, be, be a little superficial here and simplify it, but in order to make a point, is basically the starting assumption, as I said, is the people. But then you have the people electing their parliament, parliament then having the power to enact laws, and the laws in turn have an impact on the people. So people, parliament, laws, people. That in a nutshell is how the British system works. Now the problem with that, uh, which some of you might sort of not see as a problem, but certainly if you like, the rest of the world sees as a problem, is that all those steps, the people electing parliament, parliament enacting laws, all that is done by a principle. And the principle is what we can call majoritarian decision-making. Majoritarian decision-making. And I'd like you to think about that. How would you like to be governed if everything that you did was determined by a vote by a majority, a vote of a majority, what if you were slightly different? What if you were slightly idiosyncratic? What if you had strong personal views? You would probably find such a political environment quite dissatisfying. And it's partly because of this 
feeling that not everything should be decided on the basis of majoritarian decision making, that the rival constitutional tradition, which has its roots in the United States of America, grew. And that is the tradition which, contrary to the British tradition, talks about not the supremacy of parliament, but rather the supremacy of the constitution. And the American model, if I were to simplify, goes something like this. Again, you start with the people, but the people deliberate as a constitution making body and the people draft and adopt their constitution and through their constitution decide how much power should be given to parliament, how much power should be given to the government or the executive branch of government, and crucially, what matters do they think are so important that they should be put into the constitution and given protection and insulation from majoritarian decision making. And so if you look at most constitutions around the world, they will have a strong Bill of Rights. Uh, they will have provisions for independent commissions. They will have various other values and principles incorporated in that. And the point that I'm trying to make is that they put it in the constitution. The people decide to put those things in the constitution because they want to take those particular subject areas, human rights or commissions or elections commissions or whatever, human rights commissions, they want to take it outside the purview, outside the ambit of majoritarian decision making. They want to put it in the supreme law of the land so that it cannot be touched by majoritarian decision making by parliament. So can you see then that there is a fundamental difference, if you like, between what I have described as the British model, which does not have a constitution at all. And I'm simplifying here, you can argue that there are sort of unwritten norms and principles, but I'm, 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 I'm simplifying in order to make a point. The British system, where it's people, parliament, legislation, and the American tradition, which is a little bit more complicated because it's people drafting and adopting their constitution and the people through their constitution deciding how much power should be given to their political leaders and how, what entities, what mechanisms should be included in the constitution so as to protect them from majoritarian decision-making, right? And I'm sure you've all heard of John Stuart Mill's favorite, uh, famous phrase about the need to protect people from the tyranny of the majority constitutionalism, the constitutional tradition, which believes that a constitution is supreme rather than parliament, believes passionately in that notion. Right? Now, I'm stressing this a little bit for two reasons. One is that I think that students of British constitutional law perhaps don't dwell on this important point enough. And secondly, I think in Sri Lanka, our legal community has not appreciated this point adequately. I've often told my students in the past that the problem with Sri Lanka is that we are, we are operating a system which is based on the American tradition where we have a written documented constitution, but it's being applied and interpreted by people who have a British parliamentary sovereignty mindset. Because even when I was a student at the law faculty, we were taught more about British constitutional law than we were about the rival constitutional tradition that believes in the supremacy of the constitution. And just to wind up this point and emphasize it, I'd like to refer you to um, a chapter in a book by the famous constitutionalist and also economist Friedrich von Hayek, the Austrian uh, uh, economist and uh, legal philosopher, who in his book, The Constitution of Liberty, made the following observation. I'm sorry I can't put it up on the screen, but I'll try to read it uh, as slowly as I can so that you can get the quote. Now, Hayek is talking about the notion of representative democracy. 
And to you and me, as soon as we hear the phrase representative democracy, we would immediately think of elections where we elect our members of parliament so they can represent us in parliament, right? That's what people commonly immediately think of when the phrase representative democracy is uttered. But Hayek challenges that. And this quote, therefore, is very interesting. He says this, the formula that all power derives from the people referred not so much to the recurrent election of representatives as to the fact that the people organized as a constitution making body had the exclusive right to determine the powers of the representative legislature. The constitution was thus conceived as a protection of the people against all arbitrary action on the part of the legislature as well as other branches of government. So this, I think, is an extremely important point, though, that the objective of a constitution in a sense, is to protect the people from their rulers. Or in more and more modern constitutionalism would say, in addition to protecting from, also empower the people vis-a-vis -vis their rulers. That is the purpose of a constitution. That is why the people have to draft and adopt the constitution, not the politicians. Again, I used to tell my students, uh, I mean, just to emphasize the point, that asking politicians to draft a constitution is like ask, asking foxes to design hen coops. You can just imagine what a hen coop would be like if a fox is the architect of the hen coop, right? So I, I, that's a sort of extreme way of saying that the purpose of a constitution then is to protect and empower the people vis-a-vis -vis their politicians and vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis their rulers. So that's the first point. The second point that I'd like to make is uh, to flesh this out a little bit more. So a constitution basically has three main objectives. First, the one that all Sri Lankans are very familiar with. It provides a framework for political society, or to use the words of the famous British constitutional jurist, Lord Bryce, it provides a frame for political society, right? And so all the things that uh, you have studied in your course and which Sri Lankans have debated about for a long time, you know, should you have a presidential executive or a parliamentary executive? Uh, how do you elect people to the legislature? Should it be the Westminster simple plurality or first past the post system, or should it be a proportional system? Which kind of proportional system? Okay, what is the relationship between the legislature and the executive? What is the relationship between the judiciary and the other two branches of government? This would all come under framework and structure. And I would submit to you that in Sri Lanka, we have spent uh, an enormous amount of time focusing on this one aspect of the theory of constitutionalism, which is the theory that attempts to answer what the objective of a constitution should be. But there are two other points with respect to constitutionalism, which I think are equally, if not more important, and which in Sri Lanka, in my view, we have not focused on adequately. So just to re recap, in case I haven't made myself clear, the theory of constitutionalism attempts to answer the question, what is the objective of a constitution? And the theory of constitutionalism makes three points. It says that a constitution should achieve three objectives. The first is set out a framework for political society, which I just described. And there are two others, which I think are extremely important and have been ignored or relatively ignored in Sri Lanka. The second is that the purpose of a constitution is to create, in the words, I'm using the words of Carl Friedrich and a famous American constitutional theorist, a sphere of autonomy or a circle of autonomy round each individual. And I think that can be extended also to 
mean create uh, or, or protect minorities. Now, this notion of a circle of autonomy, I think is extremely important, and especially in our part of the world, where there, there are ten, there's a tendency on the part of government to try and tell us what to do, uh, even when it affects our very personal life. Right? So the notion of a sphere of autonomy is something that I would think that most young people would feel attracted by. And that is, it gives each individual space to determine things for himself or herself. Right? These are areas into which no one can intrude, neither the state nor majority opinion. Right? And obviously, we will have disagreements as to how big that circle should be. Some of us would like to have a very big circle, others would be content with a relatively small circle. But I think we would all agree that individuals should have a circle of autonomy or self-determination to be able to decide things for yourself. Now, what goes into the circle, which means that then it's a matter for each individual to decide, what is outside the circle, which means that then, uh, majority opinion can decide is highly debatable. And I'm sure you will all have different points of view about this. The classic one, which uh, has, uh, you know, uh, divided people in various constitutional democracies is whether a woman should have the right to choose whether to have an abortion or not. If you feel that it's a personal decision and the woman should have the right to choose, that means it's inside the circle. If you feel that it's more complicated than just letting the woman have, have the right to choose. There's another interest that is also involved. You would then say that it's outside the circle so that it can be determined by legislation or, or, or whatever, right? So um, sometimes it gets contentious and there have been constitutional cases on freedom of choice with respect to abortion, as you know, in the United States, in Canada, in uh, South Africa, and in many constitutional democracies. But the principle, I think, is the important one. The whole purpose of a constitution is to create a circle of autonomy around the individual, and you will immediately see the counter-majoritarian uh, aspect of a constitution applying even with respect to this. Even if a majority wants a different point of view. The argument is that because this is connected to your rights, to your dignity, to your choice, you have the freedom to decide, even though a majority of opinion in the country might have a different point of view. And that's why the former dean of Harvard Law School, school Eugene Rostow, used to always refer to a constitution as a counter-majoritarian document. A constitution is a counter-majoritarian document. The whole purpose, as I explained before, is to take things away from majoritarian decision-making so that you can protect the individual, so that you can protect the minority. And I'm talking about minority, not just in an ethnic or religious sense, but even in terms of lifestyle, opinion, or whatever. And I think that this is key to understanding what constitutionalism is all about. And I'm not so sure that in Sri Lanka, in the long process of constitutional reform that started, stuttered, and then ended from, from the mid 80s, that we have paid enough attention to this counter-majoritarian aspect of constitutionalism. So that's the second framework, sphere of autonomy. And the third is that, and this is very common in most newer constitutions, a constitution is meant to enshrine certain values and principles in it. In other words, a constitution is not just like any other law. A constitution is meant to enshrine in it certain values and principles by which that particular society wishes to be governed. And a classic example, uh, if you want to look at a constitution which has values and principles would be the South African Constitution of 1996, which is still seen as one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. And all you have to do is look at the first two articles of the South African Constitution. If you look at Article 1, and I'm paraphrasing, it talks about 
South Africa is a republic founded on the following values. And then there's a dash and you'll get a whole lot of values. Non-racism, non-sexism, human dignity, equality, supremacy of the constitution, rule of law, multi-party democracy, openness, and a lovely word that's in the first article of the South African constitution, responsiveness, responsiveness. The government has to be responsive to the people, but also people have to be responsive to each other. So can you see how values and principles are not in a preamble, not in directive principles, it is in Article 1, the first article of the South African Constitution. That's the importance South Africa attached to values and principles when they were drafting their new constitution after years of apartheid. And then you might as well just look at the second article as well. Article 2 says very simply, the constitution is supreme all law and conduct inconsistent with it is void. The constitution is supreme. All law and conduct inconsistent with it is void. And this brings me to another important point, which is fundamental to constitution making. If a constitution is going to achieve all that we have discussed so far, be a counter majoritarian document, protect the people from those who wield political power, uh, protect the individual from the tyranny of the majority, protect bills of rights and commissions that you want to give a certain amount of independence to so that they can perform their functions effectively without pressure from those who wield political power, then surely the constitution has got to have a status that gives it some sanctity, some special uh, uh, protection from, uh, otherwise it wouldn't be able to realize its reason for existence. And so the constitution must be supreme as article two of the South African constitution says, the South African constitution is. And so this is a very important and fundamental difference between what I would call the constitutional tradition and the British constitutional tradition. In Britain, parliament is supreme. In the rest of the world, if you like, or in the American tradition, the constitution is supreme, not parliament, right? And that is a key difference. Uh, parliament, a, a constitution technically cannot be an act of parliament because a constitution comes before parliament, okay? The constitution is drafted by the people and it is the founding document. And it is the constitution that sets out the powers of parliament. So in other words, parliament is a creation of the constitution. Parliament is a creature of the constitution. And so if the constitution is supreme, just think about it, look at it logically. If the constitution is supreme, and if it is the constitution that creates parliament, then surely parliament cannot pass laws which are inconsistent with the founding document, the constitution. So in other words, parliament cannot be supreme or parliament is supreme only to the extent that parliament does not enact laws that are inconsistent with the constitution. So this is another point which I think we have not sufficiently appreciated in Sri Lanka. Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist paper said that this was obvious. And he said, if you hold that parliament can pass laws inconsistent with the constitution, he used sort of politically incorrect terminology because he was writing many, many years ago. He said, you would then be suggesting that the servant is higher than the master, right? Uh, that the creature has more power than the creator. And so this is an important point. The constitution's supremacy means that not only parliament, but the executive and all other branches of government are subordinate to the constitution and owe their powers and their functions to 
the Constitution. And so if you look at America, you have the famous case of Marbury and Madison, which laid down this principle soon after the American Constitution was adopted. If you look at South Africa, soon after the 1996 Constitution was in place, there was that world-famous decision on the death penalty, S versus Makwanyane, uh, 1998, I think it was, where the Constitutional Court said that, uh, you know, legislation which allows for the death penalty is inconsistent with the Constitution and therefore void uh, because it violates so many rights, rights to dignity, life, etc. And even in Sri Lanka, those of you who have read British constitutional texts will see that even today in some of the most recent editions, certainly in Australian texts, you have reference in British constitutional law books to two famous cases that went up to the Privy Council from Ceylon, as it was then called, Leonagay and the Queen, and Bribery Commissioner and Ranasin. I picked up an Australian textbook recently, and there's a little section which is called the Ranasin Her Principle, right? This was a 2018 uh, edition of an Australian textbook on constitutional law. And if you look at Leonagay and Ranasin, these two old cases, right? They all happened because there was constitutional review of legislation or judicial review of legislation where the government of the day introduced laws and citizens challenged the validity of those laws on the basis that they violated the Solberry Constitution, which was the constitution in place at the time. And so the mechanism by which the supremacy of the constitution is upheld when it comes to parliament is called in Europe constitutional review of legislation and in the British tradition it's called judicial review of legislation and it's prevalent it's considered an obvious consequence flowing from the principle of the supremacy of the constitution in the United States of America in South Africa it's accepted in Nepal, Thailand, India, Pakistan, most nearly all South American countries which have a strong tradition of constitutionalism because uh, they were influenced a lot by American constitutional developments from the 1800s onwards. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make is that in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is one of the few countries in the world where the constitution actually prohibits judicial review of legislation. First introduced in 1972, uh, continued in 1978, and it continues even to date. And Leonage and Ranasinghe, the two cases I referred to, were pre-1972. Uh, and so this is a, a huge challenge. And I think it undermines the principle of the supremacy of the constitution. And uh, there is a political consensus uh, by polit politicians and political leaders that there should be no judicial review of legislation. One more point that flows. We're talking about fundamentals of constitution making. We talked about constitutions as a counter-majoritarian document. We talked about the constitution needing to be supreme if it is going to function as a constitution. It has to be the supreme law in reality, not just uh, in theory. And the third consequence, which I think is extremely important and very relevant for Sri Lanka today, is that since the constitution derives its legitimacy and authority from the people, it should be a consensus document. A constitution is, in other words, the basic rules of the game, right? You can't play a cricket match unless both teams agree on the rules with respect to leg before wicket or whatever, right? The rules have to be agreed upon before the match commences, right? And a constitution is something like the basic ground rules. Everyone agrees on the basic framework, the basic ground rules, and then you compete within the framework of those rules. And because of that, the constitution has to be accepted by all ideally. And it is because of that, that in most countries, there is a requirement that for a constitution to be drafted and adopted, 
you need political consensus. And the way in which they try to ensure political consensus is by requiring a two thirds majority or some kind of special majority for the adoption of a constitution. What is the purpose of having a two thirds majority requirement? It is to ensure that one political actor or one political party cannot unilaterally draft and adopt a constitution. A constitution must necessarily cut across the political spectrum and in plural societies like Sri Lanka, ideally cut across not only the political spectrum, but also the ethnic and uh, other identity spectrums as well. And so it is really quite strange that we've had in recent years politicians asking for particular political parties to be given two thirds majorities so that that party can adopt a new constitution uh, almost unilaterally. That goes against first principles of constitution making. Right, I'd like to move on. We have about a uh, little sh less than uh, 12 minutes uh, more. I'd like to quickly get on to the point about how do people get involved in constitution making, right? Um, I told you that one of the international trends has been a growing recognition that people have got to draft the constitution and for practical reasons, if that's not possible, they should at least be engaged and involved as far as is practical. And I like to look at that in a little bit more detail and discuss some of the practical challenges with respect to that. But just to show you how attitudes towards constitution making have changed, in the 1950s, um, uh, a scholar has done some work on this. He said that only 5% of the constitutions drafted in the 1950s had requirements of pub public ratification or popular engagement. Whereas since the 1970s, 40% of constitution making processes recognize the need for some sort of popular engagement or even at the end of the process, public ratification. So the rationale is obvious, right? It's meant to be the people's protection, but it also is important that people feel a sense of buy-in, they feel a sense of ownership, they feel that uh, the constitution belongs to them. And if you look at some of the more creative, imaginative uh, processes of constitution making around the world, you will see that uh, there were fairly imaginative attempts to try and engage the people and the people in all its diversity in the constitution making process. Now, there are some problems about involving the people, right? Especially in post-conflict or post-war constitution making. Because very often, uh, in, if you look at South Africa, if you look at Nepal, even if you look at Sri Lanka in the early 2000s, there was a peace process which brought together the warring parties. And obviously, because the peace process brought together the warring parties, certainly in Nepal, there was a comprehensive peace agreement. In South Africa, there were negotiations between the ANC and the uh, Nationalist Party government. The parties to the conflict will want to have a lot of say when it comes to constitution making and moving the whole peace process forward. So realistically, right, you can't expect the people to just gather together in some huge stadium and draft a constitution. And so most of the recent academic scholarship accepts the fact that the parties to the conflict, one, two, the political elites, three, technical experts are also needed in constitution. And I think if you're looking at the fundamentals of constitution making, it's very important to recognize that these three important constituencies, the parties to the conflict where that is relevant, political elites, technical experts also participate in a process which should be as inclusive and as participatory as possible. And when we say the people, remember the people in all its diversity. 
And uh, certainly in South Africa and Nepal, they recognized that around 50% of the people were women. And there were special measures adopted in both those countries to ensure that women were actively engaged in the constitution making process because they recognized that the political parties or the parties to the conflict were dominated by men. So there were special compensatory mechanisms introduced to try and ensure that there was adequate representation for women. If we have time, I'll tell you a little bit about how the Nepal process uh, uh, addressed that particular issue. So maybe I should do that because I'm very conscious of the time and I want to give, uh, uh, as the moderator said, some time for questions. If you look at South Africa, um, there were those secret talks between President de Klerk and Nelson Mandela's ANC. And then there was this challenge. How do you draft a new constitution? How do you get the people to participate in a new constitution? Because uh, uh, the existing apartheid constitution was considered illegitimate by the ANC. And so South Africa adopted a, a model which has been replicated in other parts of the world. They adopted what is called a two-stage process. The parties to the conflict negotiated an interim constitution. And in South Africa, there was a fairly comprehensive interim constitution. And under that interim constitution, they had elections so that a constituent assembly could be elected to draft and adopt the final constitution. So a two-stage approach, interim and final. Uh, South Africa was unique because the interim constitution also incorporated 34 principles and it was agreed that the final constitution should be compatible with the 34 principles that were negotiated by the political elites and put into the interim constitution. And in 1996, uh, you, you had the constitutional court, which was set up under the interim constitution, actually going through the entire draft constitution to see whether the constitution was compatible with these principles or not. And there were some parts of it which were considered incompatible with the principles and the constituent assembly had to revise the draft constitution. And then it was finally approved or certified by the constitutional court six months later. If you look at Nepal, there was a protracted civil war, just like in Sri Lanka, the Ma between the Maoists and the democratic parties. The Maoists actually controlled certain parts of Nepal. They controlled territory. There was a military stalemate. Both sides, the government side and the Maoists realized that they could not defeat the other. And so the international community and the United Nations facilitated a comprehensive peace agreement, which was signed in November, 2006. And the peace agreement, included a commitment that the parties to the conflict and the Nepal people would draft and adopt a new constitution for a new Nepal. And the, the peace agreement expressly provided that the drafting should be done by a democratically elected inclusive constituent assembly. And it also laid down some basic principles with respect to substance that the new constitution should comply with. And that was mainly with regard to state restructuring or federalism, because the minorities really wanted Nepal to move in a federal direction. But it's very interesting how a special electoral system was designed to try and ensure that the constituent assembly that drafted and adopted the constitution represented the diversity of Nepal. You know, in Sri Lanka, we think we've got a huge problem. We have, what, three, four, five ethnic groups? Nepal has over 100 ethnic groups, and they have over 50, uh, 60 to 70 different languages spoken. So here you're trying to draft a constitution for a country as diverse as Nepal. And so what did they do? They elected a 601-member constituent assembly. 191 members of that 601-member CA were women because the electoral system was specially designed to ensure that 33% of the members of the constituent assembly were women. 
And they also adopted, like in South Africa, the two-stage process. They had an interim constitution and then the final constitution. And a lot of emphasis was placed on participation. Okay, Nepal has very remote areas with no roads, but yet an effort was made to go out and engage the people, educate them about what a constitution is all about, uh, consult them. Uh, the literacy rate is not very high, so they used uh, radio and TV and the visual media, songs, comics, uh, all sorts of uh, creative mechanisms to try and engage the people in the constitution making process. And that is why I think that the South African and Nepal constitutions, the Nepal constitution, the process dragged on for much longer than was anticipated under the interim constitution, but it was finally adopted in September 2015. We're coming up to the fifth anniversary of this new constitution. I think it's extremely significant that in the year 2000, Nepal was a centralized Hindu monarchy. And in 2015, it's become a federal secular republic. A complete transformation, at least at the constitutional level, there are still challenges, but it's a significant political achievement. So let me conclude with some, uh, just to sum up so that we can open it up for questions. If you're talking about the fundamentals of constitution making, I think it's really important to start by answering the question and fully appreciating what the purpose of a constitution is and looking critically at this theory of constitutionalism, which attempts to answer that question. Secondly, it's very important for those of you who have studied British constitutional law to realize that that is an exceptional, distinctive, unique, uh, sort of model which cannot probably be replicated in other parts of the world and the rival tradition which for convenience we'll call the American tradition has influenced constitution making around the world on a much more pervasive pervasive manner in a much more pervasive manner. Thirdly I think it's very important to appreciate the relationship between constitutionalism on the one hand and democracy on the other. Generally, these two concepts are compatible with each other, but because constitutionalism also stresses the limits of majoritarian decision-making, tries to act as a restraint on the tyranny of the majority, constitutionalism is also a kind of counterpoint to democracy as well. Fourthly, it's very important to appreciate the link between the people as a concept and the constitution, because a constitution is primarily meant to protect and empower the people. Fifthly, the issue about people's involvement in constitution making. I think we need to recognize that from a theoretical point of view, it's the idea, but we also need to recognize that there may be practical considerations that make it necessary to, uh, to, to, wit to modify or to dilute that principle in the interest of real polity, involving the political elites, involving the various interest groups. And this is particularly relevant in post-conflict constitution making. Sixthly, and lastly, it's very important then to recognize that constitution making becomes important constitution making becomes significant if the constitution in reality is the supreme law of the land and if the constitution is in reality a consensus document accepted by all the political actors in society. You might think that this last point is an obvious one. The need for the constitution to be, to be supreme and the constitution to be a consensus document. But if you look at Sri Lanka, you will see that since 1972, our constitution has not been supreme in the true sense of the word. And we have never had a constitution which is a consensus document. 1972, a government with a two thirds majority unilaterally introduced a constitution. 1978, a government with a two thirds majority unilaterally introduced a constitution. And so we have never really had 
in the Sri Lankan constitutional tradition, a constitution that is both supreme and also in reality, a consensus document. I think I'll stop there so that we have, uh, as was said at the beginning, about 20 minutes for comments and questions and answers. You don't have to agree with all that I've said. I'd be happy if some of you have a counter or different point of view, but I'll also be happy to attempt to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Andrew Singer. Uh, we can now uh, take in questions. So if you have any questions, uh, so if you have any questions, you can Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you may uh, look into the icon which says participants at the bottom of your screen. And once you click on that, on the right hand side, the participants uh, bar will open and you have an option to raise your hand. So you may raise your hand and I will call out the names. You can unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. So I believe uh, Nohim uh, Abenayaka has raised uh, the hand, so you may unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and good morning, sir. Um, I have a question for you regarding what, uh, citing from what you said, sir. You said that a constitution's main purpose should be to empower and protect the peoples that it's, it is a duty to do. And, sir, citing from the conclusion of the general elections this year, only eight female representatives were selected to parliament and although we have a constitution that cites a non-discriminatory environment uh, politicians simply do not recognize women as being an important part of society and that, that has been made abundantly clear um, as none of mostly none of the re-elected politicians uh, sh not sharing any of the concerns of women and so do you think that that is a, as an issue that is endemic to Sri Lanka or do you think it is an issue that is stemmed from um, Sri Lanka as many other nation states do characterizing Athenian democracy and whereas Athenian democracy was uh, discriminatory towards women and that in itself stemming the, to the issue that we have today. Thank you. Shall we take a few questions? Uh, uh... That might be easier, right? So then I can respond to a few, a bundle of questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, another question that was asked is, how does the Nepali constitution guarantee women's participation? Uh, and uh, I believe someone else has raised their hand. Uh, Narada Fiji, you may unmute yourself and ask the question. So I have one question. So when we appointed the Constitution Assembly to uh, validate that uh, in the contest of if the, in case of people uh, propose any constitution, so is there any mechanism to select the people, uh, what role they should be and, and the, the technical expertise? Is there any uh, mechanisms to follow? That is my question number one. Number two, uh, is there any standard body uh, or institutional Constitution Assembly to uh, validate with any governing framework to make it standardization as a best practices, that's it. Okay. Uh, thank you for those three questions. Um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, try to respond to them. Um, the first two questions were about women and women's participation. And I'm glad that you raised this question because uh, as the first uh, person who asked the question implied, um, if you look at the results of the election that were concluded a few days back, women's representation in the Sri Lankan parliament has gone down from 5.8%, which was horribly inadequate, to 3.5%. And uh, I actually find it very embarrassing that Sri Lanka's record with respect to women's representation in parliament and also in local government structures is probably the worst in South Asia. Uh, you know, if you compare India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is probably the worst. And I suspect that if you even uh, 
compare it with countries in Southeast Asia, uh, our record is extremely poor. And this is, um, you know, particularly ironic because we, we pride ourselves in the fact that uh, we produced the first woman prime minister. So um, it is a huge problem. In Nepal, the way in which they addressed that was when they were drafting and making their constitution, one of the key buzzwords with respect to everything was our constitution needs to be inclusive. And the word inclusion in Nepal, because of what I just told you, that it's so diverse in terms of ethnicity uh, uh, and language, the word inclusion was accepted as a, a guiding principle for the new Nepal. And then what women's groups said was, well, if you accept the principle of inclusion, and it is meant to cover ethnic groups like the Madeshis and the Janijatis, then surely it must also apply to women as well. And so there were huge debates in the Constituent Assembly in Nepal when they were drafting the constitution as to whether there should be a fixed quota, whether it should be a principle of inclusion uh, that is just mentioned, or whether what is the mechanism, what is the uh, the provision that you put into the constitution to ensure that it is actually realized in practice, right? Uh, but because Nepal had sort of uh, accepted this principle as a guide, it would almost be unthinkable today for uh, any institution under the constitution in Nepal, whether it's a commission, whether it's, uh, you know, a committee in parliament or whatever, it would be unthinkable for it to not include women and a significant amount of representation from ethnic minority groups. So it's, a, it's as if you sort of internalize a principle so that it almost come, becomes uh, a norm. You know, you would never think of uh, not having women. I mean, uh, as you know, I work for the United Nations. It is now an accepted principle that you would walk out of a meeting if there is a panel consisting entirely of men. And it would be unthinkable for the United Nations, for any department in the United Nations to organize a meeting uh, where uh, the panel or the, the speakers or whatever consisted entirely of men. So you, I think we need to get into that uh, culture. It's not just putting something in the constitution. There needs to be a realization that if you have a parliament, which is meant to be the representative assembly of the people, and it has only 3.5% women, that there's something fundamentally wrong with an institution like that. So uh, Sri Lanka has a lot more to do. Do I think we've got complacent. We don't take it seriously, as the second question implied. We have to get much more serious. And it shouldn't just be tokenism. I think you've got to recognize that if you have women in an assembly, if you have women in a peace process, they actually bring something to it. There is a value added in having women. And so in my work before I went on leave, there were, there were initiatives in Syria and Afghanistan, where as you know, the, you know, those two countries don't necessarily automatically attach importance to uh, women's empowerment and women's representation. But the United Nations was extremely strong uh, in ensuring that there was women's engagement. So in the Syrian, peace process, which is now leading to a constitution making process, the special envoy of the Secretary General set up a women's advisory group because he said, if I'm going to perform my duties as a facilitator and a representative of the United Nations effectively, I need to listen to women's voices. And, I, uh, and so he set up a special women's advisory group. And now there are some initiatives in Afghanistan. And again, there's an insistence on women's involvement and women's engagement. So I think we've got to move in that direction. And with respect to the third question, um, there, are no, there are no international uh, sort of assemblies or institutions that review uh, constitutions. We haven't reached that stage yet. If you look at the United Nations, it's still very deferential to national sovereignty, uh, you know, and there are sort of little uh, encroachments when it comes to fundamental principles, but no way in which you can have a supranational authority which reviews constitutions. Uh, and uh, you also asked a question about how a constituent assembly is made inclusive. In both South Africa and Nepal, 
I told you there was that two-stage process. The interim constitutions, which were negotiated, included special measures to try and ensure that the Constituent Assembly that was given the responsibility of drafting the final constitution was inclusive. So in uh, Nepal, they had a special electoral system for that particular election. And they knew, they knew that 600 was necessary to provide inclusion. They also knew that for the final constitution, when you're drafting uh, details about a parliament, that there's no way in which you can have a parliament with 600 members. They said for constitution making, we need to have a bigger body because we need it to be inclusive and represent the diversity of Nepal. And in South Africa too, there were special measures. Now, some of the special measures could be quotas. Um, do you have quotas for seats in parliament? Do you have quotas for political parties in terms of nominating. Uh, the, we don't have time to go into details, but there are particular kinds of proportional representation, which have, uh, for example, uh, larger party lists or national lists, where they have something called the zebra principle, where every second candidate on the list has got to be a woman. The rank order is predetermined so that you can't, the leader can't sort of knock out all the women and appoint only men. There are ways in which this can be done. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, but uh, I think the start, what you need to actually start off with is a belief that this is important. And I think that's lacking in the political culture of Sri Lanka. Yes, shall we move on to another uh, cluster of three questions? questions? We have about 15 minutes more. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Edison. Uh, we do have uh, some time to answer a few questions. There's a question on the chat box which says, uh, how effective is the system of checks and balances in Sri Lanka, considering how presidential pardons were given in recent times by our president, as opposed to the judiciary? Uh, the second question is, uh, the South African judiciary is recognized internationally for its highly progressive nature. Knowing that the constitution does provide the basis for the three state organs, what fundamental rectifications would you suggest for the Sri Lankan constitution for the intended consequences? And the third question is, it is considered that a creating of a constitutional system where there is a strict adherence to the system of separation of powers seems improbable, specifically for the reasons of checks and balances. And what are your thoughts on this? Thank you for those questions too. Um, I'll start off with the first and third questions because they talk about checks and balances and separation of powers. Um, well, I, I know that for your particular LLB program, you don't really have to study the Sri Lankan constitution. But if I were to be extremely brief, uh, may I say that um, in my view, the 1978 constitution, which is the constitution that is currently in operation, is woefully inadequate with respect to checks and balances. And that is because so much power is vested in the office of the executive president. Um, the situation uh, has, has been improved somewhat by the adoption of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. But as you all know, uh, the 19th Amendment is under threat and uh, there are some people who, uh, who, 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 who want to do away with the 19th Amendment. And so let's see what will happen. But under the 19th Amendment, the powers of the president have been reduced and the powers of the prime minister have been increased. So you don't have uh, so much power concentrated in the office of the executive president. Um, a general point, I mean, I tried not to talk too much about the Sri Lankan constitution. Uh, the Sri Lankan constitution is fundamentally flawed from a number of the theoretical aspects that I discussed in terms of its supremacy and also in terms of checks and balances. You find that the parliament doesn't have the same power and authority that it had before 1978 and that has adversely impacted upon the prevailing system of checks and balances. And certainly you asked, a you made a specific point about presidential pardons. The constitution um, uh, has uh, uh, sort of some checks and balances with respect to the president's power to issue pardons. And I'm not sure that those checks and balances have been applied. 
in the most recent pardon. And as you know, there, there, is a, there are people who have actually gone to the Supreme Court challenging uh, the, the recent presidential pardon, which caused some supreme, uh, controversy. With respect to the separation of powers, I, 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 I must say this, I'm, uh, when you talk about strict application of separation of powers, I mean, you've studied British constitutional law, so you should know that Britain does not have a strict separation of powers. Um, and uh, I think one shouldn't get too hung up on separation of powers because the logic of a strict separation of powers would be then to have an American presidential system where you have a strict separation between the legislature and the executive. As you know, uh, the president of the United States of America appoints cabinet members from outside the legislature. And in the past, we have had presidents wanting to appoint members of the Senate or House of Representatives as members of the cabinet. And those people have had to resign before they accepted their cabinet positions. I think the important point is in the doctrine of separation of powers is that the judiciary should be completely independent. Uh, there may be a case for a certain amount of overlap between the legislature and the executive, as is the case in Britain, and as is the case to a certain extent in Sri Lanka. And that is why I prefer to use the term constitutionalism rather than separation of powers. I think constitutionalism uh, is broader in scope than separation of powers, includes separation of powers, but doesn't get hung up on this notion of a strict demarcation between the three branches of government. So that's just my personal preference. It's something that you might want to think about. And the second question was about the Constitutional Court of South Africa. You're perfectly right. It's considered one of the, the great courts. It played a key role in helping the transition from apartheid to democracy. And if you look at the Constitutional Court of South Africa, uh, I actually taught in South Africa doing that uh, just before the Constitutional Court was set up. What was key to the success of the South African Constitutional Court was the people who were appointed to it. There was a conscious decision to have a very interesting mix of people on the first South African Constitutional Court. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. The president of the court was Arthur Chaskerson who was a human rights activist. He was President Mandela's lawyer in the famous, all the trials that Mandela went through when he was an activist. They decided that it was important to have some traditional judges who, who, who had served as judges even under apartheid. And so you had a number of Afrikaans judges who brought their judicial experience over a long period of time. And one of them is Justice Ackerman, who, uh, who, who, who has given a number of very important judgments, not only on constitutional issues, but on issues pertaining to the Roman Dutch law. You also had a number of women judges. You had a, a, a woman labor lawyer, Cato Regan, who was appointed to the Constitutional Court. You had a judge who's visited Sri Lanka many, many times, Albi Sachs, who was an activist who actually has lost one of his arms and because he opened a parcel bomb while he was in exile in Mozambique. And so he was a freedom fighter. He was also a judge on the Constitutional Court. So can you imagine a court consisting of these people, English speaking, African speaking, Black, Indian, African, right? Diverse in terms of their ethnic, religious identities, but also diverse in terms of their life experiences. And they were given the responsibility of upholding and protecting the new constitution of South Africa. I really think this raises important questions about who is appointed to the court that ultimately is given the responsibility of protecting and upholding the constitution, whether it's part of the Supreme Court or whether it's a separate constitutional court. And, um, very briefly, if I could just say this, I think that the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka lacks that diversity in terms of experience. And that's one of the reasons why perhaps the court here does not enjoy the certain, certain same degree of legitimacy uh, and credibility as the Constitutional Court in South Africa. Thank you. If anyone who would like to ask any question, you may please unmute yourself or raise your hand and ask uh, the question, or you can leave questions on the chat box.
we have uh, two questions. One is uh, the Sri Lankan judiciary recognized that the Sri Lankan constitution ought to be translated in accordance with separation of powers. What's stopping the direction, a direct insertion of such concepts and doctrines into the constitution? And the second question is, understanding that UK is doing well without a codified constitution, is it a mandatory requirement for what is collective, collectively known as good governance, the presence of accountability, transparency, and the rule of law, that a codified constitution is present? Thank you. I'll, I'll answer uh, the second question first. Um, my attitude towards the British Constitution, I, I tried to make it clear. Um, it's uncodified, it's unwritten. And I think it works in Britain for particular historical reasons, right? I don't think it will work in other parts of the world. It's, uh, it's something uniquely British, it seems to be working in the British context. Uh, I have tremendous respect for it, but I do not think that it can be applied or adapted uh, to most other countries around the world. It just wouldn't work. It works in Britain because of the long political tradition. I mean, just to give you an example, there's no... I mean, there's the, what, those parliament acts or whatever, but for a very long time, there was no requirement that there should be elections every five years, right? Uh, I mean, how would that work in most countries in Africa and Asia where, you know, governments in power try to avoid having elections even when they are due and even when they are, uh, uh, that requirement is stipulated in the constitution? So my attitude towards the British constitution is I hope it continues. I think it is distinctive and unique, but it won't... Uh, it won't, uh, it's not uh, replicable in other parts of the world. The, se the first question was about separation of powers. Well, if you look at the Sri Lankan constitution, uh, if you look at Article 4, there is a kind of implicit recognition of the doctrine of separation of powers. They talk about legislative, executive, and judicial power. They also talk about the franchise. Um, so uh, you, it, it's implicitly recognized in the constitution. But I think the problem is that you can have separation of powers, you can have uh, the, the division of powers recognized, but if one organ of government is given so much power that the other organs of government are not in a position to act as a check, then separation of powers becomes meaningless. Separation of powers makes sense if there is an effective system of checks and balances. But if the judiciary can't declare legislation passed by parliament as unconstitutional after it is passed, if the president has complete legal immunity so that he, cannot, he or she cannot be made a party to legal proceedings while in office, then the checks and balances that flow logically from separation of powers become ineffective. And so if I were to recommend some change from a theoretical point of view, it would be to recognize the supremacy of the constitution and to allow for constitutional review, not only of executive action, but also of legislative action. That is the way in which the constitution can be upheld. That is a much more effective way in my view to ensure checks and balances and accountable government. And one hopes that if we move in the direction of constitutional reform, some of these fundamental principles that we discussed in the last hour and a half uh, will be borne in mind by the framers of the constitution and very importantly, by the people of Sri Lanka who must apply more pressure uh, and, and from an informed perspective, you know, on whoever is responsible for drafting and adopting a new constitution. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, you may leave it in the chat box uh, or raise your hand, or even if there are any comments that you'd like to make, please do make it now. Um, if there are no questions or comments made, we may conclude. Uh, and Mr. Andrew Singer, if there are any final words you'd like to leave us with, uh, we'd be happy to hear it now. Yeah.
discussing this with you and also listening to your questions and and uh, observations. And so my last piece of advice to you is, you know, students of British constitutional law, just remember that uh, there's a whole uh, sort of segment of constitutional law out there, which is probably not part of your official syllabus for purposes of your exam. But there are some very, I hope I've provoked you to be a little bit more interested in those bigger picture issues. And I wish you well for the rest of your course. Thank you. With the aim of wrapping up this session, I would like to give my heartiest thanks for Mr. Rohan Singer for joining this session under these circumstances. Further appreciation goes to Dr. Ross Vijay Sekara, head of Abbott Law School, and Professor Sharia Skarnival and Dr. Hiran Jayavartana from the International and Comparative Law Society. And further appreciation goes towards the Abbott staff members for their initiation and the facilitation of this webinar. And on this note, this session will be concluded.